Susie Weiss will be signing books afterwards at the Barnes & Noble tent, which is right over here. Um, and I'm honored to present her to you today. This is my favorite line. Susie quit her job in 2006 to write a book. Looks like that worked out pretty well for her, huh? Um, and then there was a Washingtonian uh, profile on her in, in March, and I'm going to read part of that. A DC native born to Swiss parents, her father worked at the World Bank. Um, she lives in Silver Spring now. She grew up mostly in Potomac, but lived from age seven to 10 in Ivory Coast. At one point, her family visited a remote village in that country to hand out bread. When the bread was exhausted, a near riot broke out as children banged on the family's Peugeot, begging for more. It made me open my eyes, she said, that some people don't have the same benefits I do. Um, she's a Holton Arms School graduate, and she joined the Peace Corps in 1990 and served in the Central African Republic. Later, she worked for, is it Jepegio? Jepigo which is a Johns Hopkins affiliated international health nonprofit. She has graduate degrees in international health from Boston U and in writing from Johns Hopkins. Um, while working in international health, she questioned her impact following a visit in 2000 to the Central African Republic. The teenage daughter of a woman she had helped a decade earlier was now facing the same poverty situation as the mother had. She decided on a new approach. Um, instead of tackling what ailed Africa, She'd highlight the commonality between that continent and the rest of the world through the eyes of five fictional female characters. And by writing her novel, The Civilized World, which is a novel in stories, she'd shine a light not on disease and poverty, but on the universal themes of family, dreams, fear, vulnerability, and tradition. If you wish to know more, you'll find interviews with her scattered all over the blogosphere. It's amazing. You're everywhere. Um, and full disclosure, I published one of Susie's stories in Gravity Dancers, a collection of fiction by Washingtonary women I published a couple of years ago. And I'll finish with a quote from Library Journal about her debut. Weiss beautifully and effortlessly captures the essence of human connection, demonstrating that despite the cultural and personal differences that separate individuals, we are often related by common threads. Please welcome Susie Weiss. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Richard. That was really nice. Um, and thanks also to the organizers of the Gaithersburg Book Festival for letting me read here today. Uh, my book came out about two months ago. And in that time, I've had a lot of time to talk about it um, to various um, audiences. And the question that I get asked the most frequently is, um, how a mid-career professional working in international health should up and decide to write a book of fiction. So I'm going to attempt to answer that question a bit today. I, uh, Richard gave some background on, on me, but um, I'll sort of complete that a little bit with uh, my, my story. Um, and then I will um, uh, talk about the book a little bit and uh, read two excerpts just to give you kind of a, a taste of, of, um, of the book. And then we should have some time left over for, for questions and answers, as, as Richard mentioned. So um, how did I go from managing international health programs to, to writing a book of fiction? Well, I come from an international background. My parents are Swiss, so although I was raised in this general area, I understood from a very early age, even if it was sort of a subconscious realization, that the US is not the center of the world that many people speak English, uh, don't speak English, uh, probably more don't speak English than do, and that there are many diverse cultures in the world. And then, as Richard mentioned, when I was seven, my family moved to the Ivory Coast for my father's job with the World Bank. I should mention my father's right here. Um, you want to say hi, Dad? <laughs> um, and so we spent three years there as a family uh, in the Ivory Coast. And my parents, um, I really respect this, they, they made a point of us spending our vacations outside of the capital. And it really exposed us to the way people live in the rural areas. And it really opened my eyes to um, the way people live in the developing world. As a child, I also liked to write throughout grade school and through high school. But when it ta came time to choose a major in college, I, and eventually a career, I decided that based on the things that I had seen in Africa, that I really wanted to do something that was sort of 
helpful or, or that would you know, uh, address the problems that I'd seen. And that in the face of those problems, writing just seemed a very frivolous uh, thing to do with my time. And so I opted for a career in public health. I got my MPH. I joined the Peace Corps in the Central African Republic and um, embarked on a career managing health programs in family planning, HIV AIDS, maternal health, uh, mostly in Africa for nearly 20 years. In fact, during that time, the thought of writing fiction hardly even occurred to me. And then, obviously, something happened. I'd been assigned for three years, again to the Ivory Coast, and at the tail end of that assignment, I went back to my, I decided to go back to my Peace Corps country, the Central African Republic. It was the year 2000. It had been exactly 10 years since I'd set foot there, and the timing just seemed very auspicious for me to find out what had happened to people that I'd, that I'd known there. I had lost touch with just about everyone I knew. Um, the you know, internet, internet didn't exist when I was a volunteer, and um, even today only exists uh, sporadically in the capital of Bangui. And I also had friends who, who weren't literate, so you know, how do you stay in touch with them? For those of you who haven't been there, Bangui is a sprawling city of about a half a million people, but it very much has this small town feel. So by the time when I got there, within two to three days, I had pretty much been found or found most of the people that I'd known. And the, you know, word got out in the grapevine that I was there, and so people came by to see me, and it was this really amazing feeling to reconnect with so many people in in such a short amount of time. But there was one person that I was fairly sure that I wouldn't find. And that was a woman named Marie Flore, who'd been my neighbor my first year when I'd been uh, in uh, the town of Bambari, and who had followed me actually to, to Bangui for my second year. And sh I had befriended her along with her three young daughters. The youngest was probably three when I left, and the eldest was probably around seven. Marie Flore had been sick for several months before my departure, and although I'd been able to get her medical attention and she was doing a lot better by the time I left, I strongly suspected that she was HIV positive. And so when I went back on my visit, I asked around about her. Uh, I wanted to know, you know what had happened to her, but she hadn't been part of my professional circle, and so no one could tell me what had become of her. And I, I kind of gave up hope of finding her. The host that I was staying with, um, he'd been one of my language trainers and um, when I was a volunteer, and he knew that I loved African drumming. So he hired a group of drummers and dancers to come and perform in the middle of the day in his courtyard. And um, usually uh, they would perform at night for funerals. So it was really quite uh, an unusual event. And of course it was very loud. So people could hear it from, a, from far away, and they all came, you know, came to see this sort of impromptu performance. And we got quite a crowd, and it was a great performance. It lasted about two hours. Um, and then afterwards, people you know, started to drift back to their, to their homes. And there were a few stragglers. And among them was a, a young woman who walked up to me, and, and she said to me in Sango, Moingambi, which means, do you know me? And I looked at her, and I realized that it was the grown-up version of the, the eldest daughter of this woman, Marie Flore, that I, had, um, that I had known. Her name is Shayla. And it was a very intense moment. Um, she started to cry, which is something that Central African women never do in public. And she sort of had to collect herself before she could tell me what had become of her, uh, of her family. Her mother had indeed died five years previously, and she, uh, her two younger sisters were taken in by an aunt, but she had been pretty much on her own um, since her mother died, and she had by now a child of her own uh, who was um, a year old, and um, Shayla was uh, probably around 16 at this time. I think we all have moments in our lives where something happens that um, sort of shakes us up and, and shifts our view of the world. 
and other people might call them coincidences, but when we look at them, we say, no, that really happened for a reason. And my encounter with Shayla was, was for me, was one of those, uh, one of those uh, events because it opened my eyes to a number of things. The first thing I realized was that um, her mother, Marie Flore, that no one outside of the CAR I even knew of her existence and that she had been voiceless to begin with, but through her death had been pretty much silenced. And um, it was almost as if she had never existed. The second thing I realized was that Shayla was at a very real risk of repeating her mother's fate. She was young and she was pretty, uh, but she was also uneducated and really didn't have any prospects. So she, you know, there were plenty of men who were willing to buy her a meal or give her money in exchange for favors that would put her at risk. And it, like, kind of like her mother, she didn't really have a, a lot of say in the matter. I also realized that I'd seen and heard other things during my time in Africa that deserved to be told and that maybe in the face of the, this voicelessness actually had to be told. Although people like Marie Flore and Shayla, you know, may not exist to the rest of the world, they, um, they have lives that matter. But most of all, I decided that um, when I'd been in college that I'd been completely wrong, that um, if you write about something that matters to you, that it's anything but frivolous. The rest of the story is pretty straightforward. I, I came back to the US uh, for my job, continued to work, um, but I also signed up for the part-time writing program at Johns Hopkins University. And when I, I graduated in 2004, and very soon after that, I realized that I would never be able to complete a full-length, book-length manuscript with the crazy work and travel schedule I had. So I, um, I gave myself the gift of a year off, and it ended up being two years to write my book. <laughs> um, I've since returned working to international health, but I'm at working as a publications editor, and um, I have a reduced work schedule, so I'm actually working on a second book. But let me tell you a bit about this book. Uh, the Civilized World is a novel in stories that is set in Africa, and it follows five women, two from Ghana and three from the US whose lives intersect in uh, different configurations and in different settings. Uh, the countries where the stories are set include the Ivory Coast, Ghana, the Central African Republic, Malawi, Ethiopia, and two stories that are set in the US. I wrote the novel in part to counterbalance the news reports that Americans are constantly hearing from Africa. I think in a way Americans have become immune to you know, the, the numbers of people dying of HIV or you know, another civil war. And um, I, I wanted to write a book that instead would focus on the day-to-day -day lives of African women and American women. And that um, it would, sh in doing so, that I hope that it would show that their cultural differences are, are really outweighed by the things that they have in common um, as women. Whether or not I've succeeded Obviously, the reader will have to decide. Um, but what I'd like to do is read two very short excerpts. Um, the first one is from a, a story called Names that was actually published in the, that's, it's actually in the current uh, issue of Bethesda Magazine, if you want to read the whole thing but don't want to buy my book. Um, <laughs> um, so um, it's called Names, and the, the protagonist is a woman named Ophelia who uh, has come to Malawi with her husband, who's a, who works for the Foreign Service, and it's their, it's their first posting. And she feels like a fish out of water. She really doesn't, um, she doesn't like Africa. And, um, but she does develop this, uh, this uh, obsession almost with um, some of the curious names that she encounters in Malawi. Sorry, I need a drink of water. I watched the girl, her hair cropped neatly against her scalp, sitting on a stool in the front yard and petting Cooper while she waits for her mother, our cook, Rose. 
She is the first Malawian child I've met who isn't afraid of our dog, and I guess her to be about eight years old. When Rose let slip last week that her youngest daughter was named Y, I couldn't resist asking her to bring the child over so I could see what she looks like. All six of the older siblings, it turns out, have boring Christian names. The introduction to Y was embarrassing. She curtsied with one knee on the ground and stayed there until I told her to get up. And there is nothing in her demeanor as I watch her pet the dog that explains her name. I go into the kitchen to find Rose. Why, why, I ask, then suddenly realize she might think I'm stuttering. I mean, how did you choose your daughter's name? She wasn't planned, Rose explains, looking down at the floor as she always does when she's addressing me. We took precautions. She pronounces the last word slowly, a term clearly reserved for this one topic, the story of why, why. We followed the nurse's advice, but I became pregnant anyway. That's why my husband named her Y. Later, I watch through the window as Rose leaves with Y, the smell of her chicken and rice dish simmering on the stove. Cooper follows the girl to the front gate, wagging his tail as if he wants to leave with her. For the rest of the day, I carry around an image of Y petting the dog, along with the sound of her name of my question echoing in my head, why, why? I wonder if her name is spelled with or without a question mark. At first, I'm eager for Philip to come home so I can tell him about her curious name, but as I mull over the story behind it, the randomness of it, I decide not to share it with him after all. Instead, I open my notebook. Beneath address, square, tonic, Spoon, express, surprise, nobody, and somebody, I add, why? Then I reread the list of names, notice how crooked some of the letters are, and decide to rewrite the whole list on a fresh sheet of paper, keeping the letters contained in symmetrically printed lines. Okay, for the second, <laughs> thank you, for the second, uh, excerpt, I'm going to read um, uh, actually uh, from a, the title story, The Civilized World, um, an excerpt. And this character um, actually uh, is very different from Ophelia. She's also American, but she has been living in Africa for years, and she actually feels very much at home there. Um, her name is Janice. She happens to be a returned Peace Corps volunteer from the Central African Republic. <laughs> and um, she she is, has gone back to the CAR with her new fiance, Bruce. And um, they are traveling on a road from a very remote area of the country to back to the capital, Bangui, on a very remote road. And they are being driven by uh, a driver named Diodoné. And um, it's just the, the three of them in the car. Uh, they, and they've just had a fight that morning. And so they are not speaking to each other. Uh, a feel, uh, Janice is seated in the front seat next to Diodoné, and Bruce is seated in the back, and they've been driving for three hours, uh, not talking to each other, and she's been stewing over their argument this whole time. Janice had once heard that a couple's differences weren't as important as how they dealt with those differences. How would it ever work if Bruce couldn't even listen to, much less respect, what Janice was trying to say. Three hours into the drive, she was ready to talk to him if he made the first move, but it was unlikely based on his continued silence. If she wanted to, them to work out some kind of understanding, even if it was just to agree to disagree, she would probably have to be the one to take the first step. Outside her window, Janice noticed a white butterfly, and then two more, floating past them randomly, like shreds of paper blowing in the wind. Within minutes, there were hundreds of them, fluttering around the car like a tropical snowstorm, tumbling against the front windshield, floating beside the side windows in a thick and hypnotic free fall. As Giudonet turned on the windshield wipers, 
Janice was reminded of the blizzards in the years her family had lived in the northern parts of the U.S. She decided that butterflies made as good a peace offering as any. Without turning around in her seat, she asked Bruce, don't the butterflies remind you of snow? When he didn't answer, she finally turned around. He was asleep, had probably been asleep all the time she'd been stewing over their argument, running her mind along the sharp edges of their differences of opinion. Somehow, Bruce had mastered the African skill of sleeping in cars, no matter how bumpy the ride. His head dangled backward over his seat, his mouth open like a baby bird. It hurt Janice's neck just to look at him. So she turned around again, a hot surge in her chest as she watched the windshield wipers smearing crushed butterflies across the window. How dare he sleep carefree after he'd wounded her with his words. How could he be so inconsiderate? Without warning, the car lurched, almost as if it had the hiccups, and then stalled. At the sight of the continuing flurry of butterflies outside her window, Janice had the sensation of being inside a snow globe, only in reverse, with the white flecks outside. She pictured a gigantic hand reaching down and shaking their car. Maybe that would get it to start again. Dudonet pushed open his door, climbed down, and propped open the hood. Without air conditioning, the air inside the car began to heat up. In the back seat, Bruce's head had shifted sideways, his face squashed against the window. Still, he was fast asleep. She could shout at him or poke him awake. No, she decided, let him slowly bake. <laughs> well, thank you. That those were the two excerpts that I had I'd planned to read. Um, how much time do we have? Um, te- do you have ten minutes left for questions? Yeah, I think I'm. I think I think I'm up at finished it. Anyway, any questions? Yes. There's a microphone there. If right in. The If you don't mind, just because then everyone can hear the question and that way I don't have to repeat it. Thank you. Unfortunately, I missed the beginning, but you did say it was a novel. So how close to autobiographical is your novel? Okay. um, uh, It's a novel in stories, just for clarification. So each, each chapter reads as a story on its own, but if you read the book together, there's a narrative arc and there's, you know, the sum is greater than the parts or whatever you, whatever the expression is. Um, but anyway, the, your, your question is one that gets asked of me all the time, which is, you know, how much of it is, how much of it really happened, um, either to me or to someone else. And um, that's a really hard question to answer. I, I don't know, um, because I, I think writers don't always realize where the inspiration comes from. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, but before I do, I, I'm curious if any, who in the audience has seen the, the movie Darjeeling Limited? Okay, only a few of you. Um, there's n- there's a writer in that in that um, in that movie played by Jason Schwartzman, and um, he's traveling in a train in India with his two brothers to find to go visit his mother in, at an ashram, and he shows each of the brothers a story he's written, and each brother's response is, "Oh, you know, great story. Um, you really captured what happened," and each time he says, "But it's fiction." And, um, and towards the end of the movie, we, re- we learned that his, what he wrote about in his story really did happen to them. And, um, and he actually admits to his brothers, okay, yeah, it really did happen. And I think it's a little bit like, I think there's a, you know, there's a kernel of truth in that because I think often, at least for me as a fiction writer, um, I'll write something and it's only later that it clicks where it came from. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, a character in the book who... Um, there's a robbery at her home and she gets locked into uh, her closet and um, you, I, you know I, I don't know anyone who, I, I was robbed but I wasn't locked in a closet so I you know I'm it wasn't until very recently that I got a an email from a friend of mine a u- former colleague who said oh I read your book and I loved it and I thought oh yeah I'll, I wonder what she thought about this one scene because 
she ha wasn't locked in a closet, but she was carjacked, and she was locked in her trunk. And I remember afterwards her saying, her, like her new mantra was, well, at least I'm not in the trunk. So <laughs> <laughs> she had like this, you know, this, this whole shift in her life view. Suddenly she was laid back. Nothing really mattered anymore. You know, nothing, like the small things didn't bother her anymore. And, and that's kind of what happens to the character. She's su suddenly she's not phased by all these little worries. And, and, uh, but it wasn't until I sort of heard from this person that I remembered that that was maybe where it came from. So, I don't know, 10% of it maybe happened, maybe 30% of it, 40, I <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yeah, let's say 10% now and then ask me, you know, ask me in five years, yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. So it sounds like you wrote, um, is this working? I, I um, can hear you. Well, I'm really loud, so <laughs> I, I don't know why that's me in the microphone. Um, it sounds like you wrote this in part because you wanted to make a difference because these were stories that you thought people needed to hear and people in country. Mm -hmm. So what would kind of be your ideal reaction? Like, mm -hmm. I read your book and then I, what's, yeah. what's your dream? Well, I should, I, I should clarify that the, the African characters in this book are actually middle class. So I'm not really, you know, n none of these characters is, is the child, um, Shayla, that, you know, that... Although my next book is set in the Central African Republic and does have a child in it, so um, I think I wasn't ready to write that yet. So, but for this book, um, it really is sort of middle class, and I, I think what I'm what I was hoping to do, or the reaction that I'd like to get is, oh, this person's just like me, you know, that that it's not like oh, you know, Africans, what are they like, you know, rather than us and them be like oh, okay, you know, they have the same hopes and fears and, you know, uh, desires that, you know, that, you know, particularly, it's since all the characters are women, you know, that are particularly common across women, you know, wanting, ha wanting to have a family, um, e wanting to feel safe, you know, those are things that all of the characters sort of have in common that I think are not specific to any one culture, um, and maybe not even any one gender. So that's... Does that answer your question? That's what I'm hoping people take home from it. Any other questions? Oh, we got another one. <laughs> I'm a teacher, and at our school, uh, we're really trying to deal with a lot of race issues and how we can have more equality. And when I hear you talking about getting to know people's stories, I think that's a really important part uh, for us in the U.S. and for dealing with uh, individuals in our classrooms, what kind of things do you think we can do to, as teachers, help to know their stories or as students help them to know mm -hmm. the rest of the world and yeah. the stories around them? Okay, I'm not a teacher, so this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm talking as a writer now, yeah. Um, I would suggest that you ask them to write from the perspective of someone from a different gender or a different race or, or both. Um, you know, some people have said to me, what gives you the right to write about an African, from an African point of view? Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's a valid question because, um, you know, as coming from sort of an oppressor culture, I realize that, you know, I, I don't want to co-opt you know, Africa, any African cultures. But there's not enough literature about Africa out there. And, and personally, I, f I mean, there's, there's quite a bit, but, um, you know, a lot of it's sort of Nigerian and, and South African. And anyway, um, I do believe that there is something inherently valuable with putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. And I think the process of writing about it really lets you get into it and explore it. Um, so, I, you know, I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, but you know, I think then there's the next question is. It's a water break. Um, so I I think it's inherently valuable to uh, to put yourself in the shoes of someone else. Um, the question then is, do you publish what you've written? Because then, of course, you know, you're um, you do, it's a completely different action because you're putting it out there and. I think there you really bear responsibility of, of getting it vetted, 
which is what I did with this book. It, because the characters are Ghanaian, I, um, I had a very close Ghanaian friend read them, and I, she, she, didn't, she didn't have any qualms about telling me what I got wrong. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I don't know if that's, a, if that's an exercise you can ask in, in school, but, you know, and, you know, doing it in first person, and, and what, is, what is that person feeling and thinking. Okay. Oh, great. We might have time for one more question if there is one. If there's not one, then maybe... Um oh, you have an announcement? I have one. Oh, you have a question. Okay. I'd like to know who your favorite African writers are. Okay. Um you know, there's a there's a w one issue I think is that um, the uh, the African writers who make it to the U.S. are anglophone, um, so that's unfortunate. Um, my French is 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 good, but um, reading literary French is another notch from reading you know reports in French. Um, so I'm just I'm just going to name some some Anglophone writers, you know, uh, Chin uh, Chinua Achebe obviously is huge. Um, uh, Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. Um, I'm also going to mention a South African writer who just wrote a, uh, a memoir um, that came out called The Jack Bank. I'm reading with him next week uh, in Baltimore. Um, his book is, is really wonderful. Um, that's all that comes to me off the top of my head. Okay. Um, okay. I think what I th is there an announcement or anything? Or do, do you? Okay. So, I th I think that there is another reader now. I mean, another another author at ten forty. So I don't want to dig into their time. Um, I think I'll be at the Barnes Noble tent. If any of you have more questions for me, or even if you want to buy a book. So thank you very much. Thank you.